So seniors, almost graduates, it's happening. Uh, the way the, the, way the uh, calendar fell this year, it seems early, doesn't it? But it's happening, and it's happening quick. And uh, parents, all of you, all the feels, man, all, of, all the feels that are taking place. Now, I, when I went off, some of y'all have heard my story. When I went off to school, uh, to college, I went about five hours away from home, which back in the day, I might as well have been across the country because I, I went off to a school where there were a couple of students from my high school, but um, not like friends that I would hang out with. But you know, when you, when you don't have friends, you're kind of desperate. So let's we'll hang out, you know, a little bit, but not so much. And my freshman year, now let me say this disclaimer up front, parents um, and students, everybody's story is different, all right? But mine, my freshman year, that first semester in particular, I was one sad, lonely dude. I really was. I mean, it was a, it was a defining moment in my life, my freshman year. Um, Stacy knows this story well, and, and it's part of my testimony, really, because uh, it was during that time that I had this kind of initial grace awakening. I was a believer. I was going off. In fact, what made it hard, I was leaving from uh, a place I grew up in all my life. I was born and raised in Charlotte, and all my friends. So I left my friends. I left uh, my family. I left my parents that I depended on a lot more than I realized or would admit. My dad got about 20 years younger and a whole lot smarter my freshman year. And um, that was weird how that happened. But um, it was, I miss my parents. I mean, I had a girlfriend, you know, I, and my best friend, my roommates. I mean, my, um, I didn't have roommates, I had, well, I had brothers. But I had um, my homies, my, my best friends that I hung out with. And, um, and I, they were gone. And, and you know what was harder than anything? All of that, and now I look back and now I understand this more, as I processed it a lot during a really lonely, kind of dark time for me, um, it was that I wasn't, I wasn't known, right? It wasn't just I didn't know anybody. I wasn't known. And therefore, now I know this, deep down I was like, so I, I'm not sure that I'm really loved. How can anybody love me if they don't know me? And, and so I was, I mean, I went through this season where, man, I was, it was hard. It was a really hard time. Um, but what I didn't do, and I'm not the hero of my story by any means, but I didn't go really off the rails. It happens in college a lot of times. I mean, I could have had friends right away, probably, if I wanted to dive into this group or that group or, you know, party. But all. So I had a roommate. His name was Rusty. It was a potluck kind of thing. And, um, and so I met him when I got there. I mean, like, I didn't know this guy. This is before, you know, Facebook and whatever. There was a time before Facebook. Um, with all of the healthy benefits of social media. There was a time when there wasn't. That was a joke. But anyway, um, but uh, so I didn't know him. So I meet him. And this is a guy I'm going to live with, right, for a while. Now, let's just say Rusty, let's sum it up with this. He loved Leonard Skinner, okay? <laughs> That's all you need to know about him. I mean, he was, you know, Leonard Skinner. Y'all know Leonard Skinner? You know, come on, Sweet Home Alabama, right? Well, they also, had a, they also had a song called Cocaine, okay? And so let's just say that Rusty, he enjoyed, <laughs> he enjoyed smoking pot, okay? I mean, just did. And so if you wrote a book about me going off to school, it would have been, it would have been entitled Naive Jeff Goes to College. And so I'm, you know, I'm like, man, so I'm living with this guy and he didn't make it. Um, he survived for a while, but he, here's what happens. Students go off to college and it's not academics that take them down. Not generally. It is the habits that they form in their lives that, that no longer help them to sustain or remain healthy. I mean, emotionally and whatever else. And so, but here's what happens. We go off to college. I'm saying all this because this is true for all of us. This is life. We go off to school, first time, kind of this newfound freedom, and we have these needs. We have this thirst within us, this longing for, for, for connection and friends and do I matter and I thought I did and y'all don't know how big time I was back in high school. I was a cheerleader and I was, or I was this, or I played soccer. I was big. Y'all don't even know this about me. And we realize now that the, the things we put our identities in no longer exist. They're not there. They're gone. And so then we start to search out, how will I fill this void? And what happens is too many students, too many adults, too many people go running right to false wells to say, this will satisfy ultimately. And you've already heard it today. You've already sensed it. If it's not Christ, if it's not him, not only will it not satisfy, it will not satiate your desires, your longings, your thirst. Most of the wells we go to, how about this? I can say, apart from Christ, 
They're poisoned. They will kill you. Because we've been designed to draw from him and him alone. And so how do we protect ourselves against the poisoned wells that we're, that we're prone to run to? And, and students, uh, this is a word for you. I had you in mind throughout this whole message. I want you to listen in because this is going to be a word that's going to bring life. It's going to bring guidance to you as you head off into, uh, yeah, next semester or whatever you're going to do. Some of you are going to be right here in Dallas, and that's a good, good thing. I want you to, you can grab your Bible. In fact, we're going to end up at John 7 here in just a moment, but I want to set this up a little bit. Um, do you ever wonder, you know, how, how your habits, if your habits are actually not helping you? We're going to talk about Jesus, the living water, all right? So you've kind of picked up on that theme. We've been in this series called The Word Spoken by the Word, and um, we're looking at how Jesus draws from the Old Testament. And here he's going to draw from really kind of this idea in the Old Testament, not a specific passage per se. And so let's talk about Jesus, the living water. All right. And I'm going to frame it this way. Three things that I want you to see. You'll see them on the screen. If you're taking notes, we're going to break it down this way. Spend more time on the first. Uh, we're going to talk about the longing. We're going to talk about the source and we're going to talk about the effect. I almost added a, a fourth point between one and two, the dilemma, but I'll talk about that. The longing, the dilemma, the quandary we find ourselves in the source and then the effect. All right, so let me put John chapter 7 in context. If you're there, you can look. Um, I want to put, put this, this whole, it's just a few verses we're going to look at. But before we get there, Jesus is speaking to a very diverse crowd, okay? In verse 30, we see that there are some who are seeking to arrest him, okay? So before we get to this passage, you can look back. In verse 25, they're, they're looking to kill him. Now think about this. Um, they, they've, they've sent some, we've already seen this along the way where we've been recent weeks looking up towards Easter. They've sent officers is what they're called here. Pharisees are sending those to go check on him, spy on him. They've been doing this for some time, but they're going in to go after him and to arrest him and bring him back. Some of them have been given orders to do this. So many were, were thinking the, he's, he's not, he doesn't look like a Messiah. He's an imposter. Verse 28, uh, verse 27. Then at verse 28, you don't know him. Jesus says, you don't know God. He's getting bold. He's already turned, you know, he, well, he's about to. He's going to turn over the tables uh, in the temple. He's causing a ruckus. Others believed him as part of the problem for the Pharisees. Verse 30, 31. The Pharisees got wind uh, that the crowds were drawn to him. And in verse 33, 34, he says, you, basically, he said, you can't contain me. You cannot stop this. Uh, God's purposes are going, the Father's purposes are going to be done. You can't stop it. You can't find me. You can't track me down. And then they start to talk to each other and say, what? In verse 40, let's see, no, verse 36. What does he mean we can't, we're not going to be able to find him? What's he talking about? We're coming after him. These are the ones who are sent to arrest him. And then leapfrog the passage we're going to look at here in a moment. And in verse 45, it says the officers, this is funny. So they go back and their, their, you know, their bosses, the, the Pharisees say, why didn't you bring him in? Where is he? And they said, this man, no one has ever spoken like him. We, we couldn't lay hands on. No, they're, they're even going, this guy, something's up. Now, nobody's ever spoken like him. What did he say? That's the question. And we find it in chapter 7, verse 37 through 39. Now, this is the last day of the feast. It's the last day of the feast. And the context of this is so it's awesome. Listen to this. This is the Feast of the Booths, it was called, the, Bo the Feast of Tabernacles. And they were commemorating their time. This was one of the three uh, major festivals in then the Jewish tradition. They're commemorating their time when they were out in the wilderness. Okay, so everything goes back to Exodus, right? And everything goes back to is, 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 ex is pulling them out, rescuing them from slavery, which is, again, just a foreshadowing of what Christ is going to do. The, the greater Moses is coming. But we see here, um, what they did was the, the, the high priest would go to the pool of Siloam. You may have heard this before. The pool of Siloam was known to have kind of medicinal healing qualities. He would go and he would, he would draw water from the pool of Siloam. And then there'd be this great processional. And he would go to the temple and all the people would follow. Big celebration. They come to Jerusalem and they are, they're living in uh, booths, is why they call it, it's tents, okay? So think, uh, I mean, like the massive crowds all around Jerusalem, around the temple, and they're living in tents, temporary dwellings for, for a while, again, just like they did when they were in the wilderness, okay? So think Woodstock, but um, more righteous, um, and the music's probably 
probably was better at, at Woodstock. But um, they're, they're there and they're all gathered around and they're sober, these people, most of them. And, and they're, they're all partying, but having a big time celebrating because there's the tension of the celebration. And it's this, we're remembering a time when we were so thirsty that we were about to die and God provided for us. He brought the water to us. While we were in the wilderness, you might remember Moses strikes the rock and the water comes forth. And so what would happen, the, the priest would come with the water. He'd also have a big uh, vat or big bowl kind of thing of, of uh, wine as well. And he would pour them out into the respective um, kind of buckets or vases and they would overflow. The water would overflow. The wine would overflow. And this, this idea that, look, God has come and he's provided for. Remember, he's the one who provides. If you're thirsty, he's the one, just as he did out in the wilderness. And so in this moment, check this out. In that space, Jesus steps into that and he says, look at verse 37. I'm going to look at the longing. That's the first thing we'll look at. Verse 37 it says this, on the last day of the feast, so the great day, that day that I just described, Jesus stood up and cried out. Now that cried out, shout. He shouted. Okay, like he didn't have, you know, he didn't have a, didn't have a mic. He's, he's shouting out to the, to the whole crowd. If anyone thirsts, other translation have him asking the question, is anybody thirsty? Because it's presumed or assumed that you, you, you are thirsty, right? If anyone, as if because everyone does, okay? Are you thirsty? Then he says, he's going to say, you come, come to me. Now, watch this. I pause here because I want to talk about the longing for just a moment. The longing, because here's our dilemma. Here's our quandary. We're all thirsty, but we do not know it. Not really. Now, in, in our finest moments, we do. But here's what happens in our culture. We have this thirst within us, this desire, this longing in us, and we know it's there, but we go to all kinds of false wells to satisfy, right? The dilemma is, and students, we do this, we go to sources that do not satisfy. We, we go to, we'll find our worth or our value in our, in our, our identity and our performance, right? Or in the approval of others. That's the one that gets us in trouble a lot, particularly in college. You know, if everybody's doing that, I'm doing that. That they, they'll get me in the group. I'm doing that. If I can buy my friends, I'll buy my friends. And it leads to all kinds of trouble. Some of us, the well we draw from, this is interesting, particularly I think young people, we could all do this, is my future self. A new and improved me. That's the focus of my life. Someday I'm going to be there. I'm going to get there. That job, I'll get healthy. I'll be the one. That's the vision of my life forward. And it drives everything we do. And what we come to realize is it's out there and we never achieve it. We never get there. This longing continues. And what happens is we draw from poisonous wells. And, and here's the thing. Marketers, advertisers want to be certain that your thirst is never satisfied. You need this. You need that. You got to have that dress. You got to have this. You got to have that. You got to look like this. You got to have that. You got to have that house. You got to do that. And, and we watch this like hundreds of advertisements coming into our, into our minds every day. What if, 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 if we were just like, no, I don't need that. I don't need that. I don't need that. We'd shut down the advertising industry. We'd shut down marketing and PR. We'd shut it all down because we're like, no, I'm content. You remember a couple of years ago, um, Sprite came out with their, you know what their motto is? Still is, I think. You know what it is? Obey your thirst. Obey your thirst. I mean, if that's not a general maxim uh, in this cultural moment, I don't know what is. That's it. You do you. I talk about this a lot. It's the false gospel. It's the, it's the secular gospel schema. That is, whatever makes you happy, go after that. In fact, you are designed to just go and satisfy your needs. Whatever they are, go after them because then you'll be, health, you'll be happy if you satisfy the needs you have. And we've talked about how this is, this is Freudian psychology. This is not biblical theology. Freudian psychology, which has impacted all, by the way, of the advertising marketing in our nation, in, in the modern West, says whatever desires you have, you need to satisfy those desires or, it, or you'll enter into all kinds of psychosis. You'll go crazy. So satisfy your desires. You do you is the modern gospel in our day. 
You do you. You choose what you want. You, want, you, want to, you prefer that? You prefer that? You want that? Go after that. And what's happening is, as believers, we fall into that as well. And we're tempted by all of these things, and we're not much different than everybody else in the world. Now, some of you may know um, the song, Ariana Grande has a song, it's called Seven Rings. I don't know if you know this song. It's probably parental advisory around the lyrics. But, um, so, parents. But here's the thing. My point is this. She, she's out shopping with her six friends. And uh, seven rings. She's going out to buy everybody rings. And so the, the lyrics, here she is. She's out shopping. It's like Rodeo Drive or something. My wrist stop watching. My neck is flossing. Make big deposits. My gloss is popping. I, did, I just said that. Um, <laughs> you, you like my hair? Well, thanks. I bought it. I don't even know what that means. Because like, I could go buy some hair. That'd be amazing. <laughs> and then, so here, then she says this. I see it, I like it, I want it, I got it. I see it, I like it, I want it, I got it. And then here's the, the chorus, okay, it goes like this. I want it, I got it, I want it, I got it. I want it, I got it, I want it, I got it. And then she says, retail therapy is my new addiction. At least she's honest, right? How many of us think that Ariana is ultimately going to be satisfied with one more purchase? One more ring, one more dress, one more purchase from one more store is finally going to satisfy her. She even notes, she says, it's an addiction. You know why? Addictions are because it does not satisfy. And you keep going back to it. And we all do it. For some of us, it might be shopping. I mean, come on, we laugh. You know, something wrong with me. I think a new dress, well, you know, that'll make me feel better. Really? I, I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of I'm struggling, man. I just need to. Or how about this? Real insidious. We sneak. Okay. I, you know, I've had a stressful day. I'm just going to, I'm just, you know, a little, 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 bit of, little bit of wine. A little bit. Not, not going to hurt anything. A little bit. Of, make me feel better, right? Or we medicate our pain in some way. And, and all of us tend to, tend to run that way because anytime you don't go to the source, you're going to be looking and drinking from other sources that are poisonous. And they kill us ultimately. Now, John Mayer had a song a couple of years ago called Something's Missing. And, and in it, he says, something's missing and I don't know what it is. And I have a thirst. And look at, listen to this. He's kind of the, the thinking man's um, musician. He says, I'd, I'd need to jump in a river. I'd have to drown first to ever satiate. There's something missing, he says, and I don't know what it is at all. Praise be to God. You've got a hunch. Many of you know. We know what it is. And we can pray for John to come to know if he doesn't know. C.S. Lewis alluded to this when he said this. Look at this quote. It's a great one. If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. But then he goes on. If none of my earthly desires satisfy it, that does not prove that the universe is a fraud. Probably earthly pleasures were meant or never meant to satisfy it, but only to arouse it to suggest the real thing. We have God-given desires. And as Blaise Pascal said, there's a void in our hearts that will never be filled until they're filled by him. It was Augustine who said, our hearts will never be satisfied until we find our satisfaction in you. That's the source. So the question that Jesus is asking us this morning is this. This is key. This is why I'm spending a lot of time on this. Are you thirsty? Do you truly recognize your thirst? Because look at this. Here's been my prayer. I was praying this morning, praying with a group this morning, praying for you. Here's the challenge. If we answer that one, are you thirsty? Nah. Not really. Okay, game over. We're done. We're done. Same with Jesus. There were those who were there who believed. There were others who wanted to kill him. Are you thirsty? Not with whatever you've got. No, we're not thirsty at all. We've already got it. And, and the challenge in our affluent culture, right, is that we have so many diversions. We have the ability for so much medication of our desires and longings and pain, at least for a moment, 
that a lot of us, if we're honest, this week, last week, how about this? Are you thirsty? No, not really. How would you know? I don't need to pray. No. Maybe you haven't been here in a while. I don't need to go to church. I don't need to be in a group with people like a connect group or some Bible study. I don't need to do that. I don't need that. I'm good. How's that going for? Are you really? I don't need to pray. I don't need, I don't need to be in God's word. You see, we can answer the question ourselves. Are you thirsty? Don't just say yes. Prove it. Do you long for him? Do you recognize your need? J.N. Darby was a theologian in the 1800s. Uh, I've referenced before. Little known Plymouth Brethren theologian. And he said this. Necessity finds him out. Only if we need him do we find him. Do you need him today? Do truly. Lord, show us our thirst. Secondly, all right, the source. Look at verse 37, 38. Lewis was right. We have these longings and it's to point us to the source on the last day of the feast. So he steps up on the great day. He cried out, if anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. As the scripture has said. Now notice he says, come to me. He doesn't say, come to me, I'll get you a drink. I'll give you a drink. He, he's saying the language is, come to me, I am. I am the drink. I am the living water. And so if we're going to receive his peace, his joy, students, listen to this. If you're going to find him in the coming days or months ahead, when you're far away from friends or family or whatever else, if you, you've got to come to him to receive it. It's, he is the drink. And so I just challenge, I challenge our students right now, I challenge you with this. On the first Sunday that you're on campus, in your new place, if you're going off to college, make plans now to be in church on that day. On that day. And, and something's going to get in the way. Something is going to, I've got that party going on. I've got this thing. I've got this mixer. I'm meeting these people. I met this new friend. I got, no, no, no. Make plans now to be with some family, some body of Christ where you can be reminded of who you are. This is true for all of us. If you're not a member of this great church, you need to join today. You need to say, I'm thirsty and I need this. And Christ is the source. He's the one. The psalmist in, in Psalm 1, what is Jesus saying? Like the scripture says, Psalm 1, you might know this. The righteous life is like a tree planted by the streams of the living water, right? Drawing from the living water. Isaiah 58, verse 11, it says, he, he speaks of God, how God will satisfy you in those, poor, in those parched places, scorched places. He, it says this, you shall be like a watered garden in those dark places. Some of you are in some dark places today. And God will satisfy like a spring whose waters do not fail. Maybe you know Proverbs 4.23. Keep your heart, guard your heart with all diligence for out of it flows springs of living water. Everything comes out of the heart. What's in your heart? What are you drinking? All right? So the Spirit gives us life. The water that we're drawing from gives us life. I'm going to just, yeah, a few things. The Spirit gives us life. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water, that is born, and then born of the Spirit, born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. We're born again by the Spirit. The Spirit gives us life. Zoe life, eternal life. Now, he gives us unity. He gives us each other. He gives us the church. The, the church is, is a body in, in 1 Corinthians 12. It says the body is one member, has, I mean, it's one, it's one, but it has many members. And all the members are one body. Though many are one body. So it is with Christ. And look at this. It says this. For in one spirit, we're all baptized, okay, into one spirit, one body. Jews, Greeks, slaves, free, male, female, young and old. And all were made to drink of one spirit. We draw from the same well. And his spirit then fills us up so we are alike. We're not uniformity. We're, it's unity in diversity. To be loved someone by someone who's not like me is truly love. And then look at this. The Spirit gives us fruit. Here's just a few things. He gives us life. He gives us unity. He gives us fruit. He gives us produce, right? And so the produce, Galatians 5, the Spirit, 
The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. How many of you know we all need more of that in our lives? We need it more in our world. And believers, we're the ones filled with the Spirit who bring this into, this, into these dark places. We bring the fruit, the Spirit. So here's the next question. Are you hydrating? That is, are you drawing from the source that actually satisfies? Are you drawing from Him? Not anything else, but from Him. What are you drinking? What are you drinking in these days? Because it's too often love out of order. Good things that become God things for us. And then thirdly, finally, the effect. Let's talk about the effect. Look at what it says here. This is where, now John gives us a little bit of um, commentary in verse 39, it goes on, he says, now this he said about the spirit whose, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the spirit had not been given because Jesus had not yet been glorified. So he's not yet gone to the cross. He's not experienced the crucifixion and the resurrection. That's when he's glorified. But he's already said in John 14, there's a spirit. The spirit is coming and he will not just be with you. He says in John 14, he'll be in you. And he even says, it's to your advantage that I leave. Because then the spirit will live in you. Students, listen to this. You are never alone. And in the coming days, next semester, when you find yourself out there, wherever you might be, you will never be alone. God is with you. His spirit is with you. And he gives us each other. And listen, whatever you're walking through right now, know that you're not alone. Turn to him. Turn to others. Share your needs with others. You will never, ever be alone. I'm going to close with this. Um, Ezekiel 47 gives us a vision. We're going to close our service. And we're going to have time, to, a moment to pray over our seniors. What a gift that will be. Ezekiel 47. You can turn there if you want, but I'm kind of going to buzz through it, um, which is what I intended to do anyway. In Ezekiel 47, I just want to see, I want you to see how this plays out. There's a vision that the Lord gives Ezekiel, he takes him to the temple. Now think with me, imagine this. He takes him to the temple and he says, out of the temple, there's this trickling. There's, he says this issuing of water. It's coming out of the temple on the east side. He, he's very specific. It's coming out because it's faced toward the east. And the water started trickling, just little drops trickling, trickling out, of, out of the temple. And then he started to follow the trail of water. And as he goes... He's walking along and it says he goes out about a thousand cubits. This is about a quarter of a mile and it led him into the water. Now he's ankle deep. And as he keeps walking, <laughs> he keeps walking and he measures again about a thousand, about another quarter mile. Now he's knee deep. The water coming out of the temple where the presence of God resides, where the spirit is. The water flows from the temple and it goes out. He keeps walking. The way the story goes, he walks until he's waist deep. Then he's up to his chest and then he's swimming. He says all of a sudden he's in a river and he's swimming. And then he says, and the Lord took me over to the banks. And where, what I saw from the banks were, 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 were trees and flowers growing. And, and then as it went, the river kept going and he kept going in the river. And fish were, 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 were all, all over and all, everything that lives. And it says everywhere the river went, the water became fresh. And it goes out into the sea. And where it went into the sea, it became fresh water. What is this? And then it says this. It says, out of the sanctuary, water flowed from the sanctuary and the fruit of the trees will be their food and their leaves for healing. This is a picture of the spirit at work in my life and in your life, in our students' lives. This is what we endeavor to do together. This is a picture of cultural renewal. This is the flourishing of all things, your family, relationships, your work, wherever you go, as you're filled with the Spirit. He fills us up as we drink from Him and as we go, everything around us flourishes. We make everything fresh because of the Spirit in us. So consider this. Here's the biblical story. The Spirit of God shows up in the garden. Adam and Eve walking with Him. Sin cuts us off. That source of water is, is stopped, cut off. We run to all kinds of places. Water becomes this, this sense of kind of judgment, this picture of judgment with the flood and 
the, 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 you know, the, the Israelites are swamped, you know, drowning in the Red Sea. But then here's what happens. The presence of God then resides in the temple, okay, the tabernacle first, and this tabernacle of booths, this, these booths, that they're celebrating this moment in the temple then later. The location of his presence is in the temple. Then watch this. Jesus shows up. And the location of the Spirit of God, the presence of God, is in Christ himself. John says he tabernacled among us. And we've seen his glory. And then Jesus says, listen, the Spirit is going to come. Your body, wherever you go, is the temple of the Holy Spirit. You and I now, with the Spirit in us, go forth to bring life, and flourishing and love, Christ's love to people. This is the church. We gather to scatter. We go forth. And, and friends, listen, and seniors, whatever your major might end up being, whatever you study, whatever you're going to do, wherever you go in life, this is what life is all about. So here's my question, the last question. Are you overflowing? Are you filled up? Are you overflowing? Are you, are you drawing from him, hydrating from him? Because this week you're going to bump up against some people. And here's what I hope will happen. I hope you, when you bump up against them, you're going to splash Jesus all over them. You're going to find out. Or you're going to be, or maybe it's with a friend or a spouse. You're going to be like, uh-oh, no, no, no. Bam, you get into a something. Uh-oh. You're just going to bump up against them and spill Jesus all over them. They're going to say, what was that? What just happened? This is the life of Christ in me. This is the spirit-filled life. And this is an eschatological vision. This is why this is so big time. It keeps going. And in Revelation 22, 1 and 2, John says this. Listen to this. The angel showed me the river of life, the water of life, bright as crystal. Now he's in the garden. Now he's in the new heaven, new earth. Okay? Flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the streets, out in the city. This is Ezekiel's vision. On either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit. There's fruit again, fruit each month. And each month it's, it's bearing fruit. And then it says, and the leaves of the tree were for the healings of the nations. The Spirit of God. And we finally see Habakkuk's pro prophecy fulfilled for the whole earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. We're going to see it. This is the only thing worth giving your life to. So are you thirsty? That's the first step. My concern is most of us are not. Go there today. Go there with him. Are you hydrating? Truly. And are you overflowing? Blessing others with the life and the love that he's given you. Let's pray together as we close this, this sermon. Lord, thank you for your grace today. Thank you for your presence in our lives. And, and Lord, we just come to you now. I pray for, for each person here. Friend, right where you are, let's not rush out of here. Pause for a moment. Maybe the most important moment of your week. Maybe the most important moment of your life. If you've never received his grace. Give him your heart now. He lived the perfect life for you. Because you couldn't. He died on the cross. For your sins. Took on your shame. Your punishment. So that you could be set free. And he rose again. As we sang, so he could resurrect you, your life. He's resurrecting you. And someday, when we leave this earth, we will find ourselves with him and all who've received him. And we will live on the new earth. And the glory of the Lord will fill the earth as the waters cover the sea. Lord, help us. We give you our lives. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. 
If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.